Hello, welcome to the Neonatal Resuscitation Pre-Course Review. My name is Christine Hardy, Regional Paramedic Educator, and uh, Dwayne Cattell, Regional Paramedic Educator. The objectives of this webinar are to describe the specific needs of the neonatal uh, patient who is requiring resuscitation and to identify the specific needs of preterm neonates in a resuscitation. So to begin with, we'll discuss who the neonatal patient is. This is a baby who is less than 30 days old. Most times it's during an active birth, so meaning right after you've assisted in a delivery, but it could also be a baby who's been taken home from the hospital um, and is less than 30 days old. So how many of these babies actually need resuscitated? Um, there's evidence that shows approximately 10% of newborns require resuscitative me measures, and namely it's uh, assisted breathing. Only about 1% require extensive resuscitation. So some of the questions that you should ask yourself um, when assessing the baby is, or immediately following birth, is was the amniotic fluid clear? Was it clear of meconium or evidence of infection? Is the baby breathing well and is he crying? And if, if it, he is, that's a good thing. Um, is there good muscle tone? If you've answered yes to all four of these questions, then it's appropriate to dry the baby, stimulate the baby, and hand the baby over to the mom. Dwayne's going to discuss some of the interventions, however, should any of the answers to those questions be no. So <clears throat> you've assisted with the delivery or the 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 child is less than 30 days old, um, you know, if, if there's problems with delivery, if they're not breathing, if the heart rate is slow, um, you know, you're going to be looking at uh, ventilating the patient, um, starting with room air, unless they're pulseless, uh, right, from the, right from first contact. Um, and you're going to look at, um, if that's the case, then you'll be ventilating with oxygen as well as uh, utilizing um, chest compressions. And for the advanced care paramedics, uh, utilizing epinephrine. Uh, one to ten thousand, either intravenous, intraosseous, or uh, down the endotracheal tube. Generally, with a neonate, you want to do your assessment every thirty seconds. So, if you're ventilating the patient with room air, um, after thirty seconds of ventilation, you're going to recheck the pulse, see where you're at, and then progress through your um, your standard of care based on that. So, the three vital signs that are key to your assessment in the new of the neonate um, is the respiratory rate the heart rate and um, examination of the, of the baby's color. So another important factor when considering um, neonatal assessment and treatment is the anticipation of the resuscitation need. So um, as a good medic, we need to consider the risk factors that could identify a possible resuscitation before we walk into the delivery or b sometimes before we go and assess a neonate who's been newly delivered and returned home. Um, if the need for uh, resuscitation is anticipated, consider calling in another crew for assistance, um, as this could be quite a difficult call. Quite a difficult call. Um, Dwayne's going to dis discuss some of the identifiable risk factors that, with a good history, um, you should be able to obtain from the mother. So, as you go through your sample history and um, <clears throat> all, all getting all the pertinent information, you know if they're if they're pre like some uh, predisposing factors for. for resuscitating a child are they preterm how early are they are they are, is the baby breech um, is there prolapse cord uh, if the water has broken uh, is there any type of infection uh, uh, or uh, staining going on the meconium staining um, is are there are there multiple uh, infants to be delivered are, are there's the twins or triplets in there uh, those are all like you get into high risk categories so with e with any birth even if you're not thinking high risk you should still anticipate and think about the worst case scenario so that way you're prepared uh, to resuscitate the child if need be It's also important to discuss quickly um, the preterm delivery. This is a delivery that occurs great, uh, before 37 weeks of gestation, and there's special characteristics of preterm neonates that we should be aware of. Um, one of them is that they are more difficult to ventilate and they're more vulnerable to injury um, because of positive pressure ventilation. So what does that mean to us? That maybe um, we're ensuring that we're just seeing a little bit of an adequate chest rise and ensuring we're not filling um, the child's 
lung area with too much pressure. Preterm babies also are predisposed to blood vessel, vessel rupture, which can result in intracranial hemorrhage, um, and they're susceptible to la rapid heat loss. So as Christine uh, spoke of earlier, these neonates, especially the preterm ones, are uh, very susceptible to heat loss. And um, we have to ensure that we keep them very, very warm, um, low birth weight, uh, their thalamus, hypothalamus, they, they have the inability to, uh, for the shivering reflex, to generate any heat. So, you know, keeping them dried, keeping them warm, wrapping them in towels or blankets, um, placing babies skin to skin with mother post delivery to have that more of a conduction effect, um, and covering them with a blanket, making sure the heat's on in the back of the truck, uh, but don't overheat them too quickly, just keep, up, keep it nice and warm so that way they, they do not lose any heat. So in talking about clearing the airway with your, these neonate patients, um, suction is necessary. Uh, remember, follow your rules for suctioning um, as per the BLS Patient Care Standards Manual. Um, not too deep, you know, only withdrawing the catheter, that sort of thing. No more than 10 seconds at a time. Remember, suctioning not only removes all the secretions, uh, it also removes oxygen as well. And by going too deep, especially in these newborns or neonates rather, um, remember if you go too deep, you could stimulate the baroreceptor response in the hypopharynx and cause them to become bradycardic. So just follow your normal suctioning routines but and watch the pressures you're suctioning under. Um, as well for the ACPs, um, if there's meconium present or you, you need to maintain that airway, absolutely intubate that patient. Now, uh, regarding oxygen and ventilating the neonate, um, as over the last little while, last couple years, um, you know, we're really saying, you know, utilize room air, utilize room air. Uh, the actual um, uh, evidence-based medicine has shown that by hyperoxygenating uh, these little neonates, it, ca it can cause free radicals formation in the brain, and in turn, it starts tearing apart the neuroglia, disrupting neurotransmitting chemicals, um, and therefore increasing intracranial pressure. A permanent tissue damage uh, can occur. So it's important that um, you start with room air because it's more of a ventilation problem rather than an oxygenation problem. And by ventilating them gently with room air with just good chest expansion would be enough to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and in turn increase their heart rate. So again, um, use caution with pressure, positive pressure ventilation in your neonate. Um, our average peak inflation should be approximately 30 to 40 centimeters of water, um, just enough to adequately see a chest rise in the neonate, um, and that should be um, adequate to successfully um, resuscitate them. The primary goal of this um, is to increase the heart rate to approximately, uh, well, above 60 and ideally above 100. So, um, talking in uh, the aspect of uh, tubing this patient, um, always try to use BLS means to maintain the airway as far as suctioning, position, oropharyngeal airways, etc. However, if you need to secure that airway because it's just it's going to be too difficult to uh, uh, do with BLS means, or there's like meconium in there, or you're just suctioning like crazy, absolutely go ahead and tube that patient. You utilize a technique that you were taught um, using like the right depth and tube size, whatever you're taught, whatever's working for you, continue to use that. But once again, if you need to maintain that airway and you need to intubate them, absolutely go and hit intubate. So we're going to discuss chest compressions and the initial resuscitation of the neonate. So let's say that we've determined that this is a neonate who possibly requires resuscitation. Obviously the first thing we're going to start to do is prepare um, the airway and prepare to start ventilating the baby. In the meantime, this is when you need your partner to start assessing the heart rate. So this takes time. Um, we're going to actually physically feel for a heart rate, a brachial heart rate in the, in the baby. Sometimes placing electrodes on may help. Um, just to match what you're hearing on the monitor to what you're counting. 
So all of this is occurring somewhat simultaneously. Um, and this is a good thing because the initial positive pressure ventilation that will be administered to the baby will be delivered optimally. And this may ensure, or this may actually kickstart the heart as Duane um, started before. Hopefully in this meantime, as we're adequately ventilating the child or the neonate, um, the heart rate will start to increase. If not, and the heart rate is still less than 60, despite the optimal ventilations, then chest compressions should be initiated. And in the neonate, that's um, one compression or one breath for every three compressions. So, uh, discussing medications for um, and volume expansion for the neonatal resuscitative care for the advanced care paramedics, uh, they are rarely used. Okay, generally ventilations on their own will bring the heart rate up uh, and then secondary with compressions. Um, however, if you have to utilize your medications to resuscitate this child with a heart rate less than 60, uh, epinephrine 1 to 10,000 is indicated, that is in our standing orders. Uh, having your IV running uh, to help with uh, fluid administration, volume expansion. The other thing to consider, if the baby is uh, limp, decreased level of awareness with a bradycardic heart rate and apneic, is once you're doing your resuscitative efforts, consider calling for Narcan in those instances where the, it, the mother, if there's a history or uh, actually what you're seeing uh, uh, is possible opiate overdose, that can cause respiratory depression and in turn bradycardia. So consider Narcan as well if the scene situation indicates that. And generally if the mother has ingested narcotics within the past four hours, that could affect the neonate upon birth, um, decreasing the respiratory drive. So the point of showing you this slide regarding the aggressive resuscitation and basically the statistics behind what type of infants survive these types of events and how long that the resuscitative efforts occur um, is to basically say we're going to transport these patients regardless but this should justify the need for you to be extremely aggressive when you come, come upon the scene where you identify a neonate that needs resuscitation. Be aggressive call for backup, get extra help, and do um, all of the processes you feel you should, ACPs, again, attempting to ventilate, and um, continue on in the resuscitative measures aggressively. Um, this slide here says that approximately 10 minutes um, of resuscitation uh, shows a very high mortality rate in children or, or in the neonate or severe neurodevelopmental disability. So again, be extremely aggressive uh, when treating the neonate in a resuscitative condition. It's always important to review our BLS standard guidelines um, for every patient, but especially the neonate. So um, once again, to reiterate, be prepared with the assembly of your neonatal resuscitation um, equipment. If you know you're going to a call where you're possibly going to encounter a neonate, bring that all with you and have it um, prepared. Rapid transport of course of all infants, uh, all neonates, with an APGAR of less than 7 or the ABCs are compromised, and we should discuss the obviously dead uh, neonate or infant. So in your BLS manual, um, it describes the neonate who has a foul body odor or skin that's blistered, skin and tissue that's deteriorated. Um, discolored, maybe the, hot, the head is soft. Um, just review this section in your BLS standards because these um, patients are basically do not resuscitate obviously dead um, infant. Um, advise the mother if you're not going to uh, start ad administrating resuscitative care to the neonate. Allow her to see the child or the, the baby. Um, provide emotional support and uh, document accordingly. And here you have your directive in front of you. Um, it is kind of a confusing directive. Uh, you have all these numbers, 30, 60, 90, heart rate above 100, you know, less than 60, between 60 and 100. So basically, when you get to your neonate, like you, sh you should be doing an assessment every 30 seconds to see their like level awareness, pulse, and any breathing patterns. Okay, so, um, so the first 30 seconds you'll assess the, the infant. Determine what the heart rate is. If the heart rate's above 100, then it's basically supportive care warmth, tactile stimulation, uh, suctioning if necessary, oxygen enriched environment. 
if the heart rate is between 60 and 100, what you're going to do is you're going to ventilate the patient with a BVM with room air for 30 seconds, one breath every second for about 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, you'll check to see what the, the heart rate is, the pulse rate is. If uh, the pulse rate has now dropped below 60, now that's when you'd hook your BVM up to the oxygen and you would actively start resuscitating this patient with chest compressions. It's variable for when you get on scene because generally with these neonates, uh, they either, they either uh, shoot up their heart rate or it plummets. There's really not a lot of in between. So just remember, every 30 seconds you're going to assess that infant's pulse rate and their breathing rate and maintain that accordingly. Yeah, and absolutely um, assure that this is occurring in a team, utilizing your partner and any other resources that you've called to the scene. So in conclusion and to recap, um, early recognition of the risk factors that um, may identify the neonate that receives resuscitation, early activation of assistance for yourself um, on this scene, early resuscitation and aggressive and ongoing resuscitation are key points um, that we want to bang home in this webinar. So if you're looking for resources about the neonate and neonatal resuscitation, um, a good place to start is the AHA guidelines. Simply Google AHA guidelines and you'll find the neonatal resuscitation um, standards as well as evidence-based um, reasons for why we do what we do. Um, there are neonatal resuscitation advanced life support courses as well. So again, I believe uh, Sunnybrook offers those types of courses and um, probably our local hospital area.